Hello. Hello. Hi. I just want to take a second and look at you. You're very beautiful. <laughs> um, hey, so, um, thank you first of all to Brandon and Tasha for, I mean, and the team. Blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> I know that you know this, but let me remind you that this is not normal right? <laughs> the past two weeks of your life have not been normal. Um, and they're strategic in God's timing for you, God's plan for you. And I think there are things that you've heard that you've forgotten um, that the Holy Spirit will remind you of in weeks and months to come. Um, Jesus said that the, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit is to remind us of the words that Jesus has spoken. So there's been things that have been spoken to you and into you that you have forgotten or you didn't register it, but in weeks and months and maybe even years to come, the Holy Spirit's going to remind you that Jesus said something to you. So hold on to that. And um, as Tasha was talking about the wind just then, just earlier, um, straight away that Keith Green song came into my head. Does anyone remember Keith Green? Yeah. He, he died in 1983, which was the year I was born. Um, but if you don't know who he is, you should, you should look him up and read No Compromise and all that good stuff. But, but when Tasha was speaking, it reminded me of um, this song he wrote. And I'm going to read you the, the lyric real quick. Um, it says, rushing wind, blow through this temple, blowing out the dust within. Come and breathe your breath upon me. I've been born again. Holy Spirit, I surrender. Take me where you want to go. Plant me by your living water. Plant me deep so I can grow. Rushing wind, blow through this temple, blowing out the dust within. Come and breathe your breath upon me, for I've been born again. And, you know, the thing about, um, Tasha talked about, you know, the wind blows out debris, and, and the song says dust. You know, the thing about dust is that sometimes you don't know it's there until the wind comes through, you know, until the wind comes through and it kicks up the dust. And one of the worst things that you can do when, when the dust kicks up is to shut the windows and hold it in. You've got to open all the windows. You've got to the wind, let the wind blow all the way through. So I think that this afternoon, the Holy Spirit's already been blowing, and some dust has started to be kicked up, and it's going to probably be kicked up. In the, next, uh, in the next little time that we have together. But don't shut the windows. Open all the windows and let them blow right through. Is that okay? Um, it is such an honor to be with you today. And I, I just want to say a huge thank you to Brian and Jen for trusting me and inviting me. That's crazy. You guys are crazy, but that's why I love you. Um, I want to thank Pastor, Pastors Bill and Benny and um, all of the Bethel Church and Bethel Music staff and team and volunteers, everyone who helps put this on. It's a pretty amazing thing, and I, I really am humbled and honored to be a part of it and to be here with you. Um, so, um, when I was praying about what I could serve to you today, I felt like the Lord was tucking me in one very clear direction, and I asked several times if there was something else, <laughs> um, but, but there, there was this one thing. Um, I think that there's something that the enemy desperately wants to keep our view limited on, our perspective distorted about, and he will bring distraction and confusion to keep us from catching even a glimpse of the true reality of the whole picture. He'll keep us thinking small about it, He'll tempt us to keep talking it down and throwing our hands in the air in exasperation about it. He wants us to think of it as a McDonald's when it's actually more like the Milky Way galaxy. Because when he, we get a revelation of this thing and when we see a tiny little glimpse of what God sees, when we through the eyes of faith see in our hearts what this is and what it will be, hell gets nauseous. I came to talk to you today about church. See, as we come more and more into our identity as sons and daughters, and we become more and more ourselves, who we were always made to be and born to be, you suddenly realize that you're not an only child, right? <laughs> um, that the people around you are sons and daughters, and that means you've got brothers and sisters, <laughs> whether you like it or not. You're part of a body and a family and a house, 
and a home and a people. And now how God forms your me is inextricably linked to what God is forming in us, his we. He's making us into something, but he's making us into something. Ephesians 2 in the message, it says, that's plain enough, isn't it? You're no longer wandering exiles. The kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here. I'm going to say that again. You belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anyone. God is building a home and he's using all of us, irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. He used the apostles and the prophets for the foundation and now he's using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus at the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy temple built by God, all of us built into it, a temple in which God is quite at home. I want to read to you now from um, one of my favorite books. Um, it's kind of crazy. So if you, has anyone heard of The Screwtape Letters by C.S. Lewis? Put your hand real high. Oh, that's maybe, what do you think, 40%, 50%? Okay, so that's good. That's good. The, the genius of this book is that C.S. Lewis, to change our perspective, he changes our perspective. So I'm actually going to read the jacket of the book because I feel like it explains it um, better because it's, kind of it's kind of kooky. But it says this, this classic has entertained and enlightened readers the world over with its sly and ironic portrayal of human life and foibles through the unique vantage of screw tape, a highly placed assistant to the devil. <laughs> At once wildly comic, deadly serious and strikingly original, C.S. Lewis gives us the correspondence of the worldly wise devil to his nephew Wormwood, a novice demon in charge of securing the damnation of an ordinary young man. The screw tape letters is the most engaging account of temptation and triumph over it ever written. So basically, this book is from the perspective of a senior demon mentoring a younger demon. When they talk about the enemy, it's their enemy, who is God. When they talk about the patient, they're talking about us, the humans. And um, when they talk about their father below, they're talking about the devil. Does that make sense? I know this is like, you're like, what are you talking about? You're talking about demons? I don't know. Um, but I'm going to read it to you. It's going to be on the screens as well. You can take photos of it to read it later. <clears throat> My dear Wormwood, I note with grave displeasure that your patient has become a Christian. Do not indulge the hope that you will escape the usual penalties. Indeed, in your better moments, I trust you would hardly even wish to do so. In the meantime, we must make the best of the situation. There is no need to despair. Hundreds of these adult converts have been reclaimed after a brief sojourn in the enemy's camp and are now with us. All the habits of the patient, both mental and bodily, are still in our favour. One of our great allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we see her, spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle which makes our boldest tempters uneasy. Hello. <laughs> but fortunately, it is quite invisible to these humans. All your patient sees is the half-finished sham gothic erection on the new building estate. When he goes inside, he sees the local grocer with rather an oily expression on his face, bustling up to him to offer him one shiny little book containing a liturgy which neither of them understands, and one shabby little book containing corrupt texts of a number of religious lyrics, mostly bad and in very small print. <laughs> when he gets to his pew and looks round him, he sees just that selection of his neighbours whom he has hitherto avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbours. Make his mind flit to and fro between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next pew. It matters very little, of course, what kind of people that the next pew really contains. You may know one of them to be a great warrior on the enemy's side. No matter, your patient, thanks to our father below, the enemy, is a fool. Provided that any of those neighbours sing out of tune or have boots that squeak or double chins or odd clothes the patient will quite easily believe that their religion must therefore be somehow ridiculous. At his present stage, you see, he has an idea of Christians in his mind which he supposes to be spiritual, but which is in fact largely pictorial. His mind is full of togas and sandals and armour and bare legs and the mere fact that the other people in church wear modern clothes is a real, though of course an unconscious difficulty to him. Never let it come to the surface. Never let him ask what he expected them to look like. Keep everything hazy. I'm going to skip some bits for time. Work hard then on the disappointment or anticlimax, which is certainly coming to the patient during his first few weeks or years or decades as a churchman. The enemy, God, 
allows this disappointment to occur on the threshold of every human endeavour. It occurs when the boy who has been enchanted in the nursery by stories from the Odyssey buckles down to really learning Greek. It occurs when lovers have got married and begin the real task of learning to live together. Oh, hey. <laughs> right? In every department of life, it marks the transition from dreaming, aspiration to laborious doing. The enemy, God, takes this risk because he has a curious fantasy of making all these disgusting little human vermin, us, into what he calls his free lovers and servants, sons is the word he uses. Desiring their freedom, he therefore refuses to carry them by their mere affections and habits to any of the goals which he sets before them. He leaves them to do it on their own. And there lies our opportunity, but also remember there lies our danger. For if once they get through this initial dryness successfully, they become much less dependent on emotion and therefore much harder to tempt. I know that was long. I'm going to pray. Lord God, I thank you for your manifold wisdom and your sovereign love for all of us, your children, and for your church. Lord, I pray that where there is pain, disappointment, and resentment at the church, that you would bring a deep and a permanent healing today. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to blow the windows wide open and allow you to blow through completely. Restore our faith. Revive our hope. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Okie dokie. In 1999, 20 years ago, I was 15 years old, and I, uh, and I walked into a small little church hall in Lower Hutt, New Zealand, um, with a congregation of about 40, 50 people. I went into the service, and I left the service without having, having spoken to anyone. But that morning, during worship, I was set free. The people who served that day would never know. But I believe that they prayed beforehand and prayed that just perhaps someone who might wander off the street might encounter the love of God. And they still to this day and not until heaven will know that I was the fruit of that prayer. And that night, I went into my room, I shut my door, and I gave my life to Jesus, though I didn't realize it at the time. After that, I began this, um, this love affair with the Bible, the Word of God, and with, with praying and with the Savior I had encountered. And a few months later, to my shock, I realized I was a Christian. Um, <laughs> And I thought that I should probably start going to church. So back to the little Salvation Army Hall, I went. My mum would drop me off. I would go in. I was the youngest by about 50 years. And then she would pick me up at the end of the, at the, end of the service, and we would go home. But in that little Salvation Army Hall in Lower Hutt, New Zealand, I learned about the mercy seat. I learned about prayer. I learned about older people who could input into me and teach me how to pray and teach me how to, word, lead, to, how to read the Word of God. I learned that worship wasn't about a sensory experience, but about engaging my faith in an encounter with the presence of God. Um, then something happened. I finished high school. I was praying about what to do, and I felt very clearly that Lord said, stay in Wellington, don't start university, and wait. I had planned to go to university and um, study journalism. And um, I said, okay, Lord, what would you have me do? And I heard nothing. Those were my instructions. Stay where you are, don't start university, and wait. Well, as it turned out, he had a plan. Shocking. Um, and within about five months of that, I had, I had uh, three major, lab major, major music labels in New Zealand asking to sign me. So at 18 years old, I signed a five-album mainstream recording deal with Sony Music. And thus began an adventure and a journey and a crazy, wild God adventure time. Um, my first album came out in New Zealand. And... Um, and did very well, and then we were preparing to uh, release it in Australia. I went to Australia to um, meet with the label, do a showcase for them, all of these things. I stepped off the plane in Sydney, Australia, and I was taken aback by a physical sense that I had come home. One of the people in our group knew some people who lived out in this place called the Hills District in Sydney. Lots of people think that Hillsong is like some deep name, but it was just a church in the hills that sung songs. That's why it's called Hillsong, that's the whole story. Um, and, so, and so I went to this very Australian thing, I went to a barbecue, and at that barbecue that night, I met um, the people who would go on to become my best friends in the world, and I met the man who was to become my husband. I, f I, I told him I was a kickboxer because it seemed appropriate. Anyway, that's another story. <laughs> but, um, but, and then that weekend, they invited me to come to their church. That church was a little place called Hillsong, and it's been my home now for 15 years. Um, I'm telling you all this for a reason. We're getting there. So I continued my, my, my career um, 
outside in the world, right, if you're in my songwriting class today, writing what would hopefully be bridges to epiphany for people who had never encountered the love of God. Um, and then in between tours, I was, I was home and I was at church. I was serving. I was doing whatever it took. I, was, I remember being charged uh, one month with wiping the, the lipstick messages off the mirrors in the women's bathroom after our women's conference. I remember putting on the vacuum backpack and vacuuming after youth, you know, the cool vacuum. Anyone else vacuum in church? If you've never vacuumed, vacuumed at church, I really recommend it. It's, um, it's a beautiful thing. But you see, I suddenly found my place and I found my people. And um, over that 15 or so years, more than that, I guess now, whenever I would go out or come back, I, was, I found that I was valued not for my gift, but for who I was. I found my people. I found my home. And I realized that what God was doing in me was inextricably linked to what God was doing in us as a church and a salvation community and us as the people of God. Fast forward, I finished my five album deal a few years ago, and, um, and now I have the honor and privilege of leading Hillsong Worship, um, which is a terrifying privilege. Um, but I say all that to say that my individual walk with God and my individual calling, I discovered it and I journeyed on it within the context of being a part of the house of God, because what God is doing in us, he is doing in us, and I can't actually grasp what God is doing in me until I get a full revelation. Well, not a full revelation, that's not till heaven. Until I get a more full, a fuller revelation of what God is doing in us, because that's how he designed it. God made it so that I could have a healthy context to be discipled, a healthy context to discover who the Savior was and what it is to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him, because it's what, it's what he's making us into, free servants, sons and daughters. Hebrews 11 um, in the NIV, it says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. To see the church as Christ sees it, to see the church as we must, to get a better revelation of who God is making all of us and making us, we have to see it through the eyes of faith. The, the Matthew Henry commentary on Hebrews 11, it says, Faith has always been the mark of God's servants from the beginning of the world. It is a firm persuasion and expectation that God will perform all he has promised to us in Christ. This persuasion allows the soul to enjoy these things now. You can enjoy church now, not just when it's perfect. We can enjoy it now when it's messy and weird and a bit awkward. Like through faith, we enjoy and we apprehend the reality of what the church will be now. The persuasion allows the soul to enjoy those things now. It gives them a subsistence of reality in the soul by the first fruits and the foretastes of them. Faith proves to the mind the reality of things that cannot be seen by the bodily eye. It is full approval of all God has revealed as holy, just, and good. So today I want to talk to us about four action points. The Bible says faith without works is dead, right? So we can, we can take hold of our faith and move it into action in four ways, right? You ready? So to see this come to pass, both the me and the we becoming the people that God has created us to be, this is what we're going to do. We stay meeting, number one, we stay meeting, number two, we stay eating, number three, we stay low, number four, we stay close. Here we go. Um, I had these amazing friends called Don Cherie and Rich Wilkerson in Miami, Florida, Florida, oh! I don't know why I do these things. What is that? I don't know. That's fine. Florida brings it out of me. It's the spirit of Florida. I don't know. Um, but I have these friends in Miami, Florida. They have an amazing church called Voo Church. I was with them last year, and, um, and the church does something that I just love. You know, they'll be up there talking about the baptism services coming up or talking about um, doing a first steps course, a new Christians course, or they'll be talking about connect groups. Maybe you haven't found friends in church yet, which is normal, right? Take some time. But um, this is what they'll do. When they're explaining these things, which might be difficult for people to understand or apprehend immediately, they'll pause and they'll say, what do we do, church? And then the whole church together says, just keep coming. <laughs> right? Like, if you don't understand something, just keep coming. If you don't see it yet, just keep coming. Hebrews tells us, Hebrews, where is it? Here, over here, this side. Hebrews 10, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together. Church is kind of like, you know, do you remember those magic eye pictures? Yeah. I'm doing such old references today. I'm only in my 30s, but I feel like I'm 75. I don't know. It's like face app, but reverse because it's inside. 
It doesn't make sense. Um, but, okay, so magic eye pictures with these books, but there were these books of pictures which if you looked at the picture at first, it just looked like a mess, like all these lines and stuff which didn't have, seem to have a particular form or structure. But if you stared at it for long enough, do you remember what happens? If you stare at the picture for long enough, like you would see another picture emerge in a different dimension. And that's what happens when we just keep coming. Like stick with it for long enough to see what God sees. Stick with it for long enough to let God show you the new, the other dimension, to, get, to let God show you what's going on behind all of that stuff. Um, screw tape in, that, um, in, the, in, the, in the letters says, all your patient sees is the half-finished sham gothic erection on the new building estate. He gets dis- we get distracted by what we don't see. We get distracted by what we do see. But if we look long enough, there's a new dimension for us to, to understand. The Holy Spirit won't waste any of the factors in using them to transform us into more of his likeness and to make us into the church. And you know, another thing that I love about the church, and this is just a little bit about church, actually, the church, but also church, is like the anti-bespoke bespokeness of church, right? You can't, we, we can't order our church experience like we can now, triple shot, decaf, two pump caramel, half 2%, half skim latte. We can't order our church experience that. We can't order our feed like we do our social. We can't choose who to follow in that way. Do you know what I mean? We can't choose what pictures are going to come up. We can't, we can't choose who's going to be preaching that day and whether we like the message. We can't choose what the song list is going to be. We can't choose if the worship leader is going to be singing in tune or not. But that's the whole point. Because when we step into church, when we just keep coming, when we stay meeting, we're a part of what God is doing on the earth globally, not just it's part of what, not just in what God is doing in us. But in his grace, he uses what he's making out of all of us, out of the Baptist church in Pennsylvania, out of the Presbyterian church in England, out of the open air church in Africa. He's using what he's doing in all of those places and all of those times. And in fact, through all of these generations and throughout history to making us into the people of God. And he's doing it through out-of-tune worship leaders and, and offering messages that don't make much sense and awkward people sitting beside us who we'd prefer not to sit next to. He's using all of it, my friends. He's using all of it. Um, so number one, stay meeting. And I know it's hard. Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The man who isolates himself rages against sound judgment. And so the very best thing that the enemy could do would be to isolate us from the body of Christ. But you know, the thing about being a body with many members is that when we're disconnected from each other, that's a crime scene. That's not a body. So I don't want to see in my generation the church continue to be a crime scene when we are supposed to be connected, when we're supposed to be all active and all part of it, in Jesus' name. So number one, we stay meeting, a.k.a. turn up. Um, Number two, stay eating. So in Acts 2.46, we see a model of this in the early church, that not only did they meet together every day in the temple courts, so they had meetings, they had church events, they met together, they studied, they were in the synagogue together. They met together in the temple courts, but they broke bread in each other's homes. Jesus set the pattern for us when he had the last supper with his disciples. When we have communion together, when we share of the Eucharist together, something magnificent happens. Jesus laid out that model for us because he wanted us to continue it, and he said, whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. He modeled a revelation of himself when bread was broken. When bread was broken, miracles happened. When the disciples, uh, after the road to Emmaus, they sat down at a table with Jesus, and it was when he broke the bread and they sat together around the table that they realized it was Jesus. And I think that I've experienced that time and time again in my own life, sitting around a table with friends, we break bread and suddenly realize that Jesus is among us, that Jesus is revealing himself. So what I'm saying is stay meeting, but stay eating. Bring the church into your homes. Have church at home. Let the Holy Spirit teach you through each other. Gather around the Bible. Gather around the Word of God. Eat together and let Jesus reveal himself. I'm just looking at the time. I actually don't have that bad eyes. I think I'm manifesting like my old spirit. It's actually like I can see that fine, but for some reason I wanted to go. I don't know. Um, okay. I also, by the way, I don't speak... Um, particularly often. So I have no idea if this content, if we're going to be here for 20 minutes or two hours. So I I feel like it will be shorter. But what I'm saying is I will give Brandon and Tasha and the team plenty of time to get up and do things. It's going to be great. 
perfect. Okay, stay meeting, stay eating, stay low. Um, oh, 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 I missed a bit, hang on. Clearly I don't do this very often. So, um, so with stay eating, we read that part in screw tape letters where it says, as at his present stage, the patient, you see he has an idea of Christians in his mind, which he supposes to be spiritual, which is in fact largely pictorial. When you sit around a table with someone, they stop becoming a caricature. They stop becoming a cliche, and they become a flesh and blood person in the image of God for you to learn from, right? So that's another reason we need to break bread together, because if I only ever see you in this context, I don't get to know you. If I only ever see you in this context, Jesus can't reveal himself as fully. We serve in church together, we stay meeting together, but we eat together, and we, stop, we break down our imaginary ideas of what people are, and we find who people really are, we journey with people, and there's great richness and revelation of Jesus in that. Amen. Number one, stay meeting. Number two, stay eating. Number three, stay low. Um, John 13, 12 to 17 in the message, it says, then do you understand what I have done to you? This is just after Jesus has um, disrobed, washed his um, disciples' feet and put on his robe again. Do you understand what I have done to you? You address me as teacher and master and rightly so. That is what I am. So if I, the master and teacher, washed your feet, you must now wash each other's feet. I've laid down a pattern for you. What I've done, you do. I'm only pointing out the obvious. A servant is not ranked above his master. An employee doesn't give orders to the employer. If you understand what I'm telling you, act like it and live a blessed life. I think that healthy serving indicates freedom. When you see people who have a healthy relationship with serving in the house, it's a sign of full security, actually. It's a sign of identity, and it's a sign of freedom. Um, and I say healthy serving because I, of course, we're in church with people, and we know that things can sometimes get complex. People can have their identity attached to serving, so I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about the healthiest way to serve is out of freedom. But if you're not free yet, it doesn't mean you shouldn't serve, because in serving together, Jesus reveals himself. In serving together, Jesus tells us. He said, um, if you love me, do what I command. When we serve together, um, when we serve together, our love for Jesus overflows, spills out into the people around us, which is exactly how it's intended. Um, in the screw tape letters again, it says, when he gets to his pew and looks around him, he sees just that selection of his neighbors whom he has hitherto avoided. You want to lean pretty heavily on those neighbors. How many people have been distracted by other people in church before? Right? Like, and how judgy are we sometimes, right? How judgy am I? There's a, there's a lady um, in our church who sings at a really high operatic pitch in all songs and in all keys. <laughs> and, and it's a bit weird, but I love it. I love it. Um, I have no point other than it's just, it's, 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 it's how it's supposed to be. We're not supposed to, like, like it says, make his mind flit to and fro between an expression like the body of Christ and the actual faces in the next few. And then he says something amazing. It matters very little, of course, what kind of people that next pew really contains. You may know them to be a great warrior on the enemy's side. In other words, you might know, you might, in other words, that person with the double chins and the weird clothes might be an incredible prayer warrior. But you're not going to get, to, you're not going to know that until you get to know them. And one of the best ways to get to know them is by serving together. One of the best ways to break down those walls is to fill the coffee urns together, to put out the chairs together, to put on the backpack vacuums and vacuum after youth. That's how we find Christ in each other and that's how Jesus reveals himself. That's how I'm becoming more of who I am and we are becoming of more of who we were called to be. <clears throat> oh, this is a good bit, I think, I hope. Okay, now I did make a disclaimer in my songwriting class that I quoted from Pope John Paul Pope John Paul II, I am going to do so again. I don't feel the same way about Mary, but it doesn't mean he says things that aren't true. Cool? <laughs> I actually came across this quote in Africa in 2005, um, where some beautiful person had hand-painted it on the back of a bus. It's one of the most treasured photos I have. It's, um, I did it like with a film camera before phones and everything. Um, but someone had painted in really large letters on the back of this bus, nobody is so poor, he has nothing to give. And nobody is so rich, he has nothing to receive. And do you know what serving teaches us and helps us apprehend within church? is bilingual humility. 
We've got to have humility both ways. That you don't ever walk, you're not ever too proud that you walk into church and think that there's nothing that you have to give somebody. And that you're not ever too full and okay. Not, not okay, no, you know what I mean. That you're not ever too together that you walk in and think that there is nothing for you to receive. Bilingual humility is what we learn when we serve together. Okay. So stay meeting, stay eating, stay low, and finally stay close. Um, when I was um, studying for this and, and reading the different accounts of, um, of the Last Supper and what that looked like and what Jesus was like with his friends and what his friends were like with him, um, I was struck again by that image in John 13 of John reclining on Jesus' chest at the Last Supper. And this thing happens where Peter tells John, he's like, hey, ask who the guy is who's going to betray him. And, um, and John is reclining on Jesus' chest, that image of, of John being so close to Jesus' heart that he was willing, Jesus was willing to share who it was. He was willing to share the secrets of his kingdom. So I was thinking, you know, when we get close enough to his heart, what is it that we would hear? I think when we get close to the heart of God, we would hear his heart for the nations. I think when we get close to the heart of God, we hear his heart for the suffering think we hear his heart for the lost but I know when we get close to the heart of God we hear his heart for the church we hear his heart for his bride when Peter has that awful but common experience we all have of of denying and betraying Jesus and then there's that incredible moment where Jesus has died he's risen the tomb is empty and then Peter goes back to doing what he's, he was doing before. He's, he's fishing, he's on a boat. And it always grabs at my heart whenever I read that verse when he sees Jesus on the shore and he realizes that, it was, that it's the Lord. I always think about what that must have felt like. But he didn't, know, he didn't know what had happened to Jesus. He didn't understand. He couldn't grasp it. But he just knew that the person he loved most in the world, he had let down terribly. And at that point that there was no hope of him ever making it right. And then all of a sudden, he's doing what he was doing before. And from a distance on the shore, he sees Jesus. It's no surprise to me that he just jumps in the water and he gets there as fast as he can. And then there's this incredible, incredible time where they have breakfast together. Again, they're sitting together around a meal, right? They're having a meal. Restoration happens around meals. And though Peter denied Jesus three times, Jesus now gives him the opportunity to say that he loves him three times. I love you. Lord, you know I love you. You know I love you. And I often find that, that Jesus takes us to some of the places of our greatest pain so that he can redeem them. I deny you, I deny you, I deny you. I love you, I love you, I love you. And then after that restoration, in the midst of that restoration, Jesus says, if you love me, feed my sheep. Now that we are close again, this is my heart. Feed my sheep. Stay close to me and hear my heartbeat. First Peter 2, 4 to 5, it says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And um, there's a story that I love that I heard many years ago which explains, I think, why we need to stay close to Jesus and to really become, to really become the church. And um, we had a, a really amazing um, prophetic pastor from Queensland in Australia come to one of our creative team nights in Sydney one time. And, he, and I talked to him about this years later, and he can't even remember saying it. Um, but it was so from the Lord that didn't surprise me. But he talked about, you know, skimming stones? Stones that you skim, like across the water, that fly... He said they, they have to be a particular smoothness, right? They have to be a particular dimension. And he said this. He said that, that stones only become perfect for skimming through one process, and that's through rubbing up against other stones. But the thing is, when you rub together stones, you know what happens, don't you? Fire, <laughs> destruction, right? <laughs> when you're rubbing together against other stones, there's fire and destruction, so, there's only, so that's not the process that makes them into skimming stones. The process of making them into skimming stones is when they're rubbing up against each other, but they're in the river. I'm going to let that sit. It's okay that we rub up against each other. It's okay. 
But in order for there not to be distraction from that, we've got to stay close. We've got to stay close. And then when we do that, the Holy Spirit uses it to, to rub off all of those edges that would poke somebody and draw blood, you know? <laughs> Without it, the Holy Spirit uses to make us something that can fly in his hand. The Holy Spirit uses us to make us those living stones by which he's building a spiritual house. Amen. Something happened, actually. This is not in my notes. But I, that was, first of all, that was crazy. That hour of worship we had just before. The Lord was saying all these things to me. I was like, that was crazy. One of the things was, and, it ha- and I do want to note that it happened here in church. I do want to note that it happened here in the house of God. For 15 years. Come on. I was actually supposed to, I felt like the Lord told me that to do in the, the stay serving thing, but I missed it and then I just saw it here, which is why I wrote it down so I wouldn't miss it and then I missed it and now it's fine, I'm coming back to it. But <laughs> for 15 years, something has been happening to me. I've never spoken about this before. Um, and God's so cool that he does weird things just because he wants to. We don't have to understand them, right? But um, 15 years ago, I started having this thing. It happens like maybe like once a year or once every two years. And I don't control it. I never see it coming. But I'll be in worship and I'll start feeling my left hand fill with something, like a warm, like thick, like liquid. And the first time it happened, I was like, am I making this up? This is crazy. Um, I was standing there in worship in our church at Hillsong, and I, and I felt it fill up. It's always the left hand. I don't, don't ask me why. And then I felt like the Holy Spirit said, go put it on the stage. So I went up and I, like, because, like, Hillsong's not, like, that weird. Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's like, it's not like there's loads of people, like, you know, like, which I love, by the way. Like, I'm so down with that. But, like, it's, like, very obvious. So I had to try and find, like, this, like, spy, like, incognito way of, like, slowly, like, making way up, my way up. And then, like... And this happens, seriously, this is what happens. Like, every year or every two years when it happens, I, like, look, I, like, slowly go, and then I just got this. <laughs> just like, and I just wipe it and, like, leave. Okay, that's it. Right, that's the end of my... But, so, I don't know the last time that happened, but it happened just down there in worship. And <laughs> some of you probably would have said, I was trying to be, like, really normal next to Paul McClure, and then I'm just, like, leaving, and I'm just, like, wiping, like... <laughs> going back, like, that's cool, God. Sweet. But for the first time ever, I felt like God gave me a bit of insight into what that is in 15 years. And I, and I felt like he said, this is for the platform. The platform is not for you. That's why we serve. That's why God has given these things, all of them. First Peter says that every gift God has given us is to administrate God's grace in its various forms. And I don't know what having a thick, weird hand and wiping it on a stage is going to do. But God does, and whether that's putting out chairs or encouraging somebody or having the conversation that you know is going to be awkward, that's what carries the anointing because we serve the platform. And I don't necessarily just mean the stage. I mean what it represents. I mean it represents what God is doing. We serve that. That doesn't serve us. We serve the move. The move is not here to serve us. Okay. We're almost done. I'm going to refer back to that. um, Oh, and actually, okay, who is it, Lord? Okay. You, man, hello, man. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Can you be more specific? (laughs) Jen's like, Paul A, Paul K. I'm like, hey, man. You're a man, I think. 
Um, you man, white person. Sorry, I'm not supposed to say that. <laughs> I'm really not doing well at this so far. Um, you just wiped your hair. I brought an extra copy of this because I knew God was going to... I just feel like this is for you. So, yeah, for you. You're the guy. So, um... I... Auf Wiedersehen. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm real jet lagged, you guys. I slept for three hours. Okay. Back to this, back to the screw tape that is. That bit that I love, that I froth on, that it melts my face off. This <laughs> is that the demons see the church spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. It's a spectacle which makes the boldest demons uneasy. Think about the people in this room. Think about the people in your home church. Think about the church in this generation on the earth right now. Times it by 2,000. Times it by however millennia we have left to go before Jesus comes back. That's the church. That's not a small thing. That's not a weak thing. It's not a perfect thing yet, but it's the heart of God, his bride. Hebrews 12 says it like this. I'm going to read it in the Bible because that's always the best way. From verse 18, it says, You have not come to a mountain that can be touched, that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom and storm. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Brandon and team and guys, you can come if you want. Um, I'm shutting down. Um, Ephesians 3.20, 21 says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. So Brandon and Tasha and the team are going to come now. And, um, and they're going to sing, this is a move again, and we're going to sing it together. But this is what I came to you to say. The body of Christ, like I said before, when we are separated and disconnected and severed from each other, it's gruesome. That's a crime scene. But when a body is connected and the blood is flowing through, and this is not a rhetorical question, I want you to answer me. What does it do? I'm moving, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> when the body of Christ is united and animated with Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that is the move. When we are the church, when you invite God to show you through eyes of faith what he is making you and what he is making us. When you stay meeting, when we stay meeting, when we stay eating, when we stay low, and when we stay close, this is a move. In a minute, we're going to sing, but I just want to pray for people because I know that that kicked up some dust. And I don't pretend to even be remotely qualified to know how to pray in a way that would heal you if you are someone who has experienced deep disappointment with the church or bitterness. But I can I know how to ask God. And so I do want to give people some privacy for a minute. If let's um, let's just bow our heads, give everyone around you some privacy.
What's the Lord showing you today in our time together? The Bible says, strengthen strengthen the weak knees that are about to fail, for they are not to become lame but to be healed. That was a massacre of the actual words, but if you're limping a bit, that's okay. But let the Lord touch you today so that you do not become lame, but so that you are healed. If there's been some dust kicked up, you didn't even know it was there. It's been there a long time. It's been settled. But the wind of the Holy Spirit has kicked it up, not to shame you, not to condemn you, not to judge you. But open the windows. Let him blow through. Let him blow it all out. If that's you and you just know, you feel the Holy Spirit inviting you to find freedom and healing if you've experienced disappointment with the church or worse, if you're cynical and numb, if you don't feel like you're part of it, would you just put up your hand so I can see you? No one else is looking. I'm the only, me and Jesus, we can see you. But he can see you, that's most important. I'm going to pray. Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, God, that (laughs) bodies are still being raised. Your body, your church. Jesus, where there is deep disappointment in this room, where there is bitterness, resentment, cynicism, hurt, or just confusion, why is this thing the way it is in my situation? Why did that leader misunderstand me? Why did I misunderstand the leader? Lord Jesus, just blow through right now, I pray. Blow out the dust, blow out the things that obscure our vision and help us to see with faith who you are making us. Who you're making us all over the world in every generation of people that you call your own. I pray that you would bring a deep healing, Lord Jesus, to people's hearts and people's souls and people's spirits right now. Do what only you can do, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So I know the awesome team here have, um, have prayer ministry available. I saw the times on the screens early, but if you know there's still more to do, don't neglect it. Keep opening all the windows. Get prayer if you need to. Get counselling if you need to. But can I encourage you to invite God to show you what He sees when He looks in the church? And more importantly, can I invite you to be a part of it? Can I remind you that you are a part of it? Can I remind you what the Bible says, that you belong here with as much right to the name Christian as anybody, that God is building a house, He is redeeming a bride, and He needs all of us to take our place and be our part. In Jesus' name, we love you guys.
open up my heart
Oh, church. Lay your hands on your neighbor. See, this is where we get to be the church. The person on your right and left might be one prayer away from their breakthrough. Might just be one prayer away from that dream in their heart being fulfilled. Go ahead and just pray. Release a new grace of God. Release the power of God into their life. for courage. Pray that there be a new impartation of courage in their life. Okay, now lay your hand on your own heart. Pray for courage for yourself. You need it too. Courage, Lord. Courage. God saying over each and every one of us that, that those future dreams that you have are closer than you think. It's actually closer than you think. That God is about to break through in ways you've never seen him break through before. So God, we say we're ready. We receive it. And God, we say we'll also give that away. Let us be people of courage and hope to the world that desperately needs to see the authentic identity of what the church is supposed to be. Help us be that. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And everyone said... Iron Man, come on. <laughs>